all right? Many people are going to want to be involved in physical activity and movement skills within other contexts, right? For fun, with their family, to keep healthy, okay? And so that interacting triangle that we've been looking at all semester is um, a way to to define what's happening, what the person is doing, what the context is, what the skill is, right? And let's look at how that interacts to produce a particular movement pattern. So these interacting constraints, remember at certain times in the lifespan, particularly our individual constraints are going to be more influential than at other times. So if I'm going through puberty, the change in my skeleton is going to be very dramatic and that will have a big impact on my movement patterns. When I'm elderly and I'm losing muscle mass and I'm losing strength, that will have an impact on my movement patterns. Right? So um, we can use that triangle model across the whole lifespan. Right? From little, little people to our grandparents. All right? It's important that we treat each person as an individual, that we don't um, globalize concepts around movement. All right? um, it'll help us to design developmentally appropriate tasks. So like we talked about yesterday for the playground layout, you know, if we understand this idea of the constraints model, our triangle, then that helps us to develop something that's more appropriate for the population that we're working with. All right? Our goal is always to enhance learning. All right? So we can do that in many different ways when we're in charge of the class, then we've got the opportunity to manipulate different environmental task constraints. You know, we can't manipulate much about the individual on a particular day, but I can help that individual be more successful and have more fun by manipulating the environment and the task. Right? So, um, when I'm working with the children on the playground, this is at the forefront of my thinking most of the time, right? Because I can manipulate things that they don't realize are being manipulated to help them achieve the movement pattern that I want, right? So they don't know that my intent is manipulation. They think they're just having fun and playing, right? But I can tweak things and change what they're achieving in a way that helps them be more successful, right? Um, so they uh, have a great example of um, certain, like, um, games and things that you can play. So there's a really good example for, um, let's say, throwing. I think it's a throwing. Yes, a throwing. So they have a game that they call Clean House, right? And what the what they do is they put up a uh, volleyball net, and then they've got a pile of balls and and bean bags and what have you, right? So one of the issues when we have people who don't throw very well is that, um, and you'll have seen this on the, on the films, when I want them to throw underhand, they want to throw overhand, and when I want them to throw overhand, they, they will insist on chucking underhand and things. <laughs> um, so one of the things we want to encourage, along with, of course, stepping in opposition, but if we've got stepping in opposition, one of the things we might need to encourage is getting the elbow up, right, before releasing the ball. So this game 
that, that they're using helps with that without the kids or whoever you're working with knowing that that's really what you're doing, right? You just say, okay, we're going to play a game. We're going to divide you up into two. Half of you on one side, half of you on the other side. And the side that has all the um, bean bags and balls, right? You're going to try and clean your house and throw all the rubbish into the other house, the other side. And the people on the other side, your job is to keep your house clean by chucking them back over the net. Well, if you think about it, if you've got relatively small, so either like elementary or maybe a younger middle school before they've gone into puberty, if I have to throw something over a volleyball net to get it out of my house, it automatically makes you lift your elbow up without doing anything, right? So you can just play a game and influence the movement pattern to get the elbow up, which I think is a really cool idea, right? So hopefully you'll see that, that maybe um, this chapter will help you understand pulling this together and actually using it in the real world. So the first thing we get to do as the teacher, coach, trainer, right, is to structure the environment. So that's step one, really, of our planning, right? So we have to be able to be flexible, all right? So let's see, we know that the wall color affects catching. So can I play around with the wall color, either inside or outside. How can I do that, right? We've got the surface to think of, okay? So am I gonna play outside on the grass? Am I gonna play on a, a tarmac top on the playground? Am I gonna be inside in the gym on a shiny floor? What's that going to be like, right? How will that impact what I'm trying to help them learn, okay? And then we've got things like the weather, right? We always have to be flexible about the weather. You always want to go in with a plan A, plan B, plan C, right? Because you can't control what's happening with the weather, and the weather doesn't mean we cancel PE or we cancel the the training session, right? It just means we either change up what we're going to be doing outside in the weather or we're going to have a different plan of action to move the session indoors, all right? So the more you teach, the more flexible you become, right? You've seen me goof up several times across this semester. You know, it happens. You just have to kind of get on with it, right? Okay, this was a complete mess. What do you go? So how can I salvage something from this, right? Um, and then my second thing I get to do, so I get to structure the environment, control to some extent, or manipulate those environmental constraints, okay? And then I get to um, also do some manipulation of the task constraints, right? So I have to design the task thoughtfully to make sure that I am doing something that's appropriate, right? So remember, I've got the goals, I've got the rules, and I've got the equipment, right? So, you know, Think about the difference when we looked at throwing for distance, throwing really hard, versus what happened when we looked at throwing for accuracy, right? So we see very different throwing actions depending on what it is I ask them to achieve, okay? Um, we need to incorporate the idea of body scaling, all right? Dep 
depending, of course, on who I'm working with. If I'm working with high school, older high school kids, then they're coming into the end of their growing phase. Maybe I don't have to use um, body scale equipment with them. But if I'm working with younger kids, or if I'm working with someone who's very weak, right? then scaling the equipment so that they can achieve some measure of success with the task is an important idea to pay attention to. Right? Success means fun. Failure means not fun. Right? And there is only a very small population of people whose mindset is, when I fail, I'm just going to go back and do it again until I get it right. Right? The majority of people, when they fail, if they fail consistently, go, I'm no good at this, I'm going to go try something else. Right? Okay. So remember that the rules, you're in charge of the class, you can change the rules. Right? So if you watch wheelchair tennis, wheelchair tennis is allowed two bounces before they hit the ball. Right? Makes sense, because they've got to get to the ball. Okay? If I'm working with uh, soccer, I don't have to have a full soccer game. I can have a five on five, and then more people get to play. Right? All kinds of things you can do. Once you understand the concept, you're in charge of the manipulation. You can do whatever you like if you're the teacher or the coach or the trainer. Right? It's your job to play and come up with new creative ways of, of, of exhibiting a task. Right? So, on to our task analysis. So, let's see if I can get this around the right way. All right, so what the book talks about is that traditionally, when we do a task analysis, we often have a picture in our head of what is correct, right, or perfect, and that's our model and we compare what we're looking at with the model and we get error, right? And then we have to um, put that error into good cues and feedback to try to correct what we're seeing, all right? So if we use a different approach, Right? If we use a constraints-based approach that allows for the interaction of all these constraints, then we're going to say, okay, not everyone is going to look like my correct, perfect model. Does that mean they can't achieve the outcome? No, because the body is an amazing piece of machinery. It can achieve multiple different outcomes taking different paths, right? So I don't have to have everybody looking like what I think is correct and perfect. Okay? So we want to make sure that we have an appropriate task for their skill level. It's got to challenge them, but it's got to allow them to have some success. It can't be too easy because we get bored when things are too easy, and then we don't try very hard, and then we don't learn, right? So that doesn't work. We have to have, you know, a way of evolving something to keep up the challenge level for these people that we're working with, all right? So they propose a constraints-based task analysis which is the tool that I was talking about earlier. I think you'll find it will be really useful, okay? So they have four steps in the process, okay? 
Step one is, duh, pick the task or the skill that you want them to learn or do, right? Step two is determine the individual constraints. And let me see if I can find this. It's on page 364. Step two then is, I've got my task. What are the individual constraints that would allow for success in that task? Okay, so I pick a couple of individual constraints. Step three is, okay, what are the environmental and task constraints that I can manipulate to help them learn this skill? And then step four is to create a continuum, a practice range from something that's easy to do to something that is difficult to do. All right. Remember that a relatively small change in a constraint can lead to a big difference in a movement pattern. So I don't always have to come up with dramatic jumps on my continuum. Okay? And then they've got um, some examples and we're going to go through an example now. All right? Any questions so far? None so far. None so far. Okay. All right. This is where I have to use the whiteboard. So the example I've put together is for a kicking task. Alright, so my, my skill is kicking. So that's step one. Step two, remember, is knowing or having a, an idea of what constraints, individual constraints, do I think might be important to be good at kicking? All right? So, Kayla, what would be an individual constraint that I would need to run a kickable? Okay, an individual constraint for kicking, um, to I'm trying to think of... Don't make it complicated, mm -hmm. right? Just think about watching someone kick. So for example, if I'm swinging one leg to kick the ball, what do I need to be able to do? On the other leg. Oh, you need balance. There you go, perfect, right? So balance, balance would be an ideal the individual, individual yes. constraint, right? So, Jean, if I'm gonna balance and I'm gonna kick this ball really hard, what do I need in my legs? Power. Power, okay. Power, I would say strength, but power will do. So we'll say power, stroke, strength. Oops, probably not how you spell that word. There we go. All right. And if I am going to run 
and kick a ball, would I need coordination? Remember our abilities that we looked at? We said that multi-limb coordination is an ability which makes it an individual construct. Does that make sense? So we're going to add coordination here. And you can go on and on. But we're going to keep it relatively simple. We don't, you know, always start simple. You can always add things in later on. But if you start with something that's too complicated, it's likely to go belly up, right? So we've got our individual constraints, some of the constraints that might impact how successful I am at kicking. There's many others, I'm sure. Okay. So now what we have to do is think about these constraints and think about what would be task and environment constraints that would train or help these individual constraints. Okay. So if I think about balance and coordination, right? When, when we looked at kicking on the playground with the children, right, and we looked at the development of kicking, what did we say often was the starting phase for kicking, right? If you think of your MSU child, what happens in stage one of kicking? Do they run up to the ball? They stay stationary. They stay stationary, right? So if they're stationary, the ball has to be stationary. Does that make sense? Yes. So, I think a good oh no, we don't want that, we want green. I think a good task constraint that I can manipulate as the teacher would be the movement of the ball. Oops. Does that make sense? So yes. Think about the task of kicking, right? Then I have to make this continuum from uh, let's go here. Let's go. I've got to come up with something that's simple or easy and I'm going to create a continuum that goes to something that is complex or difficult. Okay. So if we think about movement of the ball, what is an easy version of movement of the ball? You just said it, Kayla. What would be the easiest version I could set up for a child to kick a ball? You have the ball in front of them, but the ball's not moving, so you just sit it in front of them. Right, so the ball is stationary, right? What would be very complex and difficult would be if the ball was moving very fast and from certain directions, right? 
So let's make it simple for now. We'll say the ball is moving fast. Um, on a diagonal, right? Does that make sense? Yes. So then, my job as the teacher is to create certain levels on this continuum, right? So I'm going to have a couple of other options on my continuum. Right? So the first one could be something like the ball is rolling slowly. Right? From in front of them towards them, because that would be the simplest from a perceptual point of view. Then you could say the ball is rolling, and then you get to decide, right? Is it, do you want your next step to, to be the ball is rolling quickly toward them, or do you want the next step to be the ball is rolling slowly from side to side? because that's more difficult for, depending on the age group you're working with. Side to side would be more difficult for young children than front to back, right? So, you're the teacher, you get to decide, right? Am I gonna go, I've got them kicking the ball when it's rolling slowly towards them, right? Am I going to go quicker towards them, or am I going to go slowly side to side? It's not a right or a wrong. It's an experiment. It's science, right? I put in what I think might work best next, and when I try it, it goes completely pear-shaped. And I go, ha, huh, okay, that didn't work. I have to rejig my continuum. Right? It's always a work in progress, depending upon what actually happened in the lesson. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's go back and pick another constraint. If I'm going to work on power and strength, what constraint would I possibly use to think about working on the strength of their legs? Could you manipulate how far they run to kick a ball or how heavy the ball is that they're kicking? Excellent. How heavy the ball is, how far they have to run. What about how far they have to kick? Right? So am I having them kick, just kick it over the skipping rope that's in front of them, or am I having them kick to hit a target on the wall several feet away? Right? So we've got three options there already. How far am I going to have them run? How heavy is the ball? So weight of the ball, right? Do you see, you, you could end up with a chart that has 10 or so different constraints on it, and you get to pick the ones you want to work with each time, right? So if we're looking at weight of the ball, what kind of ball might we use for the simple, easy task. A simple plastic one, I feel like, would do just fine. Something small enough to where they're not kicking like a, a soccer-sized ball. Maybe something a little smaller that doesn't have um, a lot of weight to weight it. Like good. A normal ball, maybe you would find it like the dog store or something meant for just like a small child to kick it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe 
um, if we were looking, if we had money and we were looking in a catalog, right, you could look for a slow-mo ball, but you could go to Walmart and you could find a small beach ball. Right? That wouldn't weigh very much. Those kind of blow-up balls that we toss around on the beach, they don't weigh anything. Does the size of it really matter though? Because I mean, if you have a small child that is going to take a beach ball, like, itself matter? You know? So, again, that would be something to experiment with. I would say a great big beach ball. So, like, if I'm if I'm playing with one of those big blow-up balls, that would be too big. But if I could find a little beach ball, it's going to be harder for an, a child to kick something that's very small. So I don't want to use a tennis ball, right, or anything like that. I need something kind of this size to start with, I would say. Right? The knobbly balls are good as well. Um, but again, you're not going to find a knobbly ball at Walmart. You're going to have to go to a catalog, a toy catalog, specific PE catalog to find the, the range of balls that I have in the shed. Right? What would be the difficult version? You might have seen some of these. Could we say something like a, uh, I don't know if this would make any sense, but maybe a medicine ball because they are like at insane yeah. and heavy? <laughs> yeah, a medicine ball or like ball. I have on the playground the rag balls that look like a soccer ball. They've got the black and white hexagons on them, but they're really heavy. And so yeah, medicine. Or something, a ball with sand inside it. Absolutely. Oh good lord, I can't spell today. Yeah, right? Do you see what I mean? It's not, once you get going, and you've got the idea of simple to difficult, then it's just finding a way of creating a continuum for that constraint. Make sense? And then you would do the same thing, right? You would come up with different versions of ball, of weight of ball. And I don't know that you would have that many. You might only have two in here, right? So let's Oh, no, 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 no. That's not funny. Is there an... I just wanted to rub out one line. Is there an undo? Now what am I doing? Okay, I have no idea what just happened. How do I get my... That was looking good. Okay, individually have balance, power, strength, and coordination, right? And then we had Thank you. 
movement for him, right? Having a weighted ball, right? Yes. And we said a slower or small beach ball. And down here we had This is a task constraint. And this is a task constraint, which is okay. And we could, as you've already mentioned, we could have quite a few other task constraints that we could change, okay? Size of the ball, um, distance that they're gonna be kicking the ball, distance they're going to be running to kick the ball, right? So we've got task constraints, I think, are relatively easy to come up with. But we need to also think about an environmental constraint that might impact kicking. All right, so we want an environmental one. So, to me, there's an obvious one um, for kicking. And I would have to, once I've done the obvious one, think quite hard to come up with another one. Um, so, what do you think about the surface that I'm kicking on? Grass is much harder. Okay, so we can have surface. And, and a gym floor would be easier. Okay, so we're going to say grass is harder and the gym floor is easier. Okay, and you might even say Sand is harder than grass, right? I don't know, dirt, okay? What am I gonna have here as my interim options, right? Now, I think it's, and again, it's up to you, you're the teacher, you gotta try it, right? It's science. It's just like a little mini experiment. Right? I have a plan, I have a hypothesis, I go and test it, it works or it doesn't work, and I have to tweak my hypothesis. Right? And that's what teaching is, is really about. Right? Do I understand enough to, when it doesn't go right, to know what, I, what my options are to change it? Okay? So one of the conversations I've had in the past um, with students in the classroom who are soccer players is that depending on the shoes they've got on, that when they have to train indoors in the gym, it's actually more difficult than outside on the grass because they don't feel so stable on the gym floor, right? So it may turn out 
that actually grass is easy and the gym floor is harder. Right? It might depend on which task constraints you're putting in place. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? So, we create the matrix and then what can we do with it once we've created it, right? Then the fun bit comes in because I can do a couple of different things, right? The first thing I can use it for is to structure my lesson plan, right? So, I've got lots of options here for scaling up or down for challenge. So let's say it's day one, year one, and we're gonna do kicking. I've not seen these children before. I don't know what they're able to do or not do. So I'm gonna set up my lesson plan. Oops. like this. Let's stick with our gym floor as the easy version. Right? Day one, year one, kicking. And I'm going to set up my gym with opportunities to practice using this version of the skill. And I walk around, I watch them, I make note of who's managing to kick the ball, who can't kick the ball, right? How far are they kicking it? I'm not worried about that for today, but I, that gives me an idea of how confident they are or how strong they are. It's all kinds of information I can get by watching this lesson plan, right? And I realized that probably for some of the children, the ball being stationary was a bit too easy, right? Not for all of the children, but for some of the children. So when I do lesson number two, I'm going to add in some version of rolling the ball. And then I might do, after a, a, I don't know, depending on what I'm seeing with the children, I might do something like, go here, pick a different type of ball, and maybe take them out onto the tarmac in the playground. So I've got all these options here. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Right? So you have to put in a lot of work to create the matrix in the first place. That takes time and thought, right? And you may have to tweak it because it may or may not work the way you expected it to. But once you've got the matrix, you've got umpteen different lesson plans right there at your fingertips, right? Now the other way you could use this that they suggest in the chapter is that you could use it to standardize your assessment of kicking. So again, depending on what you're required to produce for reports, for parents, for um, asking for extra funding for your PE program or your coaching program, right? Um, if you have to show percentile rank improvement on a skill, you need to use the TGMD. But 
if you're doing assessments for your records on this child that you can show to parents and your school isn't interested in their score, right? Then you could use the MSU chart or you could use this idea because now I can say, okay, let's pick, I don't know if we have another, oh, we have yellow. Okay, it's gonna look a bit icky, but let's use yellow. So the yellow line is gonna represent an assessment. Okay, so let's say little Jane assessed at the beginning of the semester with the very basic level. When I tried to start rolling the ball, she kept missing it, right? And if I tried to increase the weight of the ball, it barely left her foot. Okay? So when I do my assessment right at the beginning of the semester, she comes out here. When we've done a kicking unit for, I have no idea, so here I'm going to be ignorant, I have no idea how long you do a unit for MPE, but let's say four weeks, right? So we do a kicking unit for four weeks and I reassess her, right? Now, I've got here, here, and here. So I have a clear improvement in her kicking skill. Right? I can assess her developmental level. I can intervene with kicking unit and then I can post assess her and hopefully see an improvement in the particular constraints I've been practicing within the unit, right? So if I create my matrix and I have 10 constraints but for year one, um, semester one, I only practice three of those constraints then I only see improvement in those constraints. You wouldn't expect to see improvement in something you weren't targeting in the lesson, right? Unless the child grew, right? So you might see improvement because she suddenly shot up five inches and put on 10 pounds and now she can kick the ball further, right? But that doesn't have anything to do with her skill level. Does that make sense? So, you're going to make one of those matrices as the final assignment. All right? So, up on Blackboard, can you see this sheet of paper? Yes, I can. Yeah? Okay, so up on Blackboard there will be this for you, right? And you're going to go through step one, step two, step three, step four. So step one, what is the task that you're going to create the analysis for, right? What are the individual constraints that you think impact success in that task? What are the environment and task constraints you can manipulate? What is a simple to complex continuum that you can create? <laughs> that person is having fun! <laughs> yes. Questions? Does this need to be a skill specifically from like the MSU chart? No, it can be anything you want. Anything you want. I, I would make it easy for yourself and not make it too complicated a skill, right? Um, 
because what I'm looking for in the assignment is your understanding of how to create this matrix idea because I really do think it's a useful tool um, and that it will benefit you. So what I'm looking for is that you understand the concept of the ecological task analysis. Not that you can create one for something that's really difficult. Right? So, you know, I really don't mind what skill you pick. Um, give it a go. Okay, that sounds good. So, Dr. Wall, are we, are we just basically picking a skill and doing different types of constraints for them and making a chart? Yeah, just like we just okay. did for yeah, just like we just did for kicking. Okay. Exactly like that, but you're going to do it for a skill you pick and submit the little matrix. So you'll just fill in you'll fill in these boxes and just send that in to me. All right? And they have another example. So in the in the book they give you an example for throwing. So you can't use basic throwing, right? They also give you an example for striking, so you can't use basic striking because those would be copied from the book, right? But you could use different versions of those skills, okay? So you've got three examples, and I don't know, I did not have time to look at the um, worksheets for this chapter on the website for the textbook. I don't know if they have another version, but we've done a kicking, you've got a throwing, and you've got a striking. So I think you've got enough examples. If you read the text carefully and understand the concept, I think you've got enough examples to have a good go at this ecological task analysis. What do you think? I think we got it. Yes, we got it, we got it. So just then just to wrap up that chapter or even really the whole semester I guess is just to think that what what I hope you take away from this is that as the teacher and Please remember that if you are a coach, you are a teacher. If you are a personal trainer, you are a teacher. If you are an athletic trainer, you are a teacher, right? So when I use the term teacher, that is an all-encompassing. I'm not talking about just someone who is a PE teacher, right? or a classroom teacher. We're talking about anybody who is responsible for helping people learn motor skills or improve motor skills, right? So our job then, our, our task, is to use as much of our knowledge as we can to foster optimal motor development in every person we come into contact with. And you can use that same idea to say optimal fitness for that person, right? Or optimal weight loss once we get to exercise physiology. Or optimal motor learning for that individual, for that task, right? In this class, in specifically, we're talking about optimal motor development but you can apply that same idea. What is my job as the teacher? Right? My job is to foster optimal learning. Right? And what do I know, what tools do I have that I can bring to bear to help me achieve that? Right? Because it's an important 
job. Okay? Teachers get poo-pooed, although less so now. It's going to be very interesting, I think. One of the pluses, if, there are, if you could say there are going to be any pluses, that might come out of this COVID debacle that we've lived with this year, is that I think people are going to hold teachers in much higher esteem than they were before. Because this has been really, really hard. And anybody with children who have teachers who are trying to maintain their learning curve during this time is going to have a much better perspective of the work that that teacher puts in, I think. So, if it's possible to say there's going to be a little bit of a silver lining at the end of the day, that might be one of them. Okay, and then just to let you know, there's a really nice article up on Blackboard for you to read. Um, it's from JOPED, which is the Journal for Physical Edu Education, Recreation and Dance. Very practitioner, easy to read, um, full of useful tips. One of the authors of the article is one of the authors of our textbook. It's called Combining Theory and Practice in the Gymnasium. Um, and I think that that will give you some very useful um, ways of applying this information that we've been working with this semester. So, that's it. We're done. Can you believe it? So there will be a lecture that's coming. Thursday is going to be your review session. So, okay. if you two want me to, my plan was just to do what we have done for the other exams, to have those questions and go through. Um, I can open that them. Works. Yeah, I can open those up as soon yeah. as I get home, so that you've got them ahead of time. Um, that's what I was planning for Thursday. Let's do that. Okay. All right. And then you know, by Thursday, you might go, "Ooh, I needed to go over something, right?" So. Just let me know. Um, but I think between the chapter and the examples, I think the task analysis will make sense to you. Okay? I think so. And I cannot remember when it's due, but if you need me to extend it a little bit, let me know because of, the, of studying for the exam. I can't remember what the timelines are. I don't remember what day your exam is next week, but it's on the syllabus. I'm assuming that they're expecting us to stick to the exam schedule. They haven't said anything about that, but that, that's my plan. That sounds good. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and being so good about turning up for class and lab and asking questions and all that stuff. I appreciate it. This would have been unbearable. Of course. <laughs> This would have been absolutely unbearable if I had been trying to just talk to an empty room. So I do appreciate your efforts on that. And um, yeah, I don't plan anything for lab tomorrow. I'm just assuming that um, you'll be working on the layout and things like that. If you want me to dial into class because you need to talk to me, drop me an email. Because um, I'll just be at home grading. <laughs> and...
Sounds like a good plan. Okie dokie. All right. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You as well.